If you want to know about AI or artificial intelligence, first you have to think about what is human intelligence, right? So think about the people you know or meet during the day. Do, do they all have the same intelligence? When you think about it, you're trying to define artificial intelligence. It means we're really trying to compare it to something. And for us, that, that means human intelligence. This is the Geese Download, a podcast from the University of Illinois' Geese College of Business. I'm your host, Tim Sinclair, and today we're talking with Robert Brunner. Robert is the Chief Disruption Officer at Geese and an expert and visionary when it comes to the world of emerging technologies and information. You probably have one of my favorite job titles of anybody we've we've interviewed on the podcast so far. What in your definition or maybe the job description you have is a Chief Disruption Officer? I'm glad you like the title. Um, you can thank Jeff, you know, uh, Dean Brown for that. He, he came up with the title. Um, so, you know, what, what is a chief disruption officer? I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, and, and part of the interest in why, why people think it sounds interesting is because it's not a, a common uh, position. And, and so it's not really well defined, right? You can't look around and say, hey, there's uh, 10 chief disruption officers. Let's just sort of figure out what they're doing. And that, that's what we do. So, so I used to be um, uh, a full professor over in the astronomy department, and I moved my faculty position over to an accountancy department here at Geese, uh, I, I want to say in 2017. Um, and the reason, the reason that happened is I was, I was discussing with uh, all around campus, I was, I was like leading our, our, our data analytic efforts around campus and trying to help build some coherent, you know, coherent uh, whole across all of the different units and met a lot of people. Jeff was one of them. Uh, and some of the other people, and particularly in accountancy, and they needed help with data analytics. And so uh, I, I moved over here, was helping them create new curricula and thinking, you know, in terms of strategy, what should the college be doing in this space? And among some of these conversations, um, I sort of suggested, you know, data analytics is just the tip of the iceberg when we think about uh, potentially disruptive technologies. And, you know, that that really Geese had a unique opportunity here being on a campus like the University of Illinois where there's so much STEM talent and so many interesting things going on to sort of think about what's over the horizon more than perhaps other business schools could. And I think in these conversations, uh, Dean Brown sort of, you know, drank the Kool-Aid, if you will, and and realized that, you know, that there is this uh, huge tidal wave of change that's going to be coming um, not just to the Geese College of Business or the University of Illinois, but but basically everywhere. And that, you know, it really would be in our best interest to be thinking more proactively about what's coming and and try to be less reactive. And he sort of decided, you know, we should make Robert Chief Disruption Officer. Um, and so, you know, that's that's really what I do. I sort of look over the horizon, spot potentially disruptive technologies um, or technologies that when combined will be disruptive or even more disruptive and try to help prepare the entire college, um, you know, whether that's students, faculty and staff, or even alumni uh, and our partners for what's to come. That was going to be my next question. You addressed it a little bit there, but are you helping geese be disruptive in how they do education? Are you helping students be disruptive in how they go into the world and use the tools that the school has equipped them with? Is it a combination of, of both? Where's your focus been? Yes to all the above and more. Okay. Um, I, I think, well, I'm a, I'm a big believer. Um, and in fact, I would just, uh, I'll just quote Larry Geese. Larry Geese says, I have a bias to action. I'm one of those people that has a bias to action. And that that is, Yes, you learn a lot by reading. Yes, you learn a lot by listening to others. But but in some sense, if you really want to understand how something could be disruptive, you have to get that experience. Uh, and so a great example is a couple of years ago, we were really interested in blockchain and we're, you know, we know there's lots of opportunities. We've read about a lot of these things. We were talking and working with some people and, and uh, corporate partners and alumni in this space. But it just felt like, you know, we needed to, to take that next step. And so we uh, recruited some students, um, and it was literally two years ago over the summer, we built the Geese blockchain. And by doing that, it really opened our eyes to just how disruptive this technology could be and all of the ways that just in our own industry, higher education, uh, it could help do things 
faster, more easily than our traditional ways because of its its very nature, right? It's 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 a transparent database that can't be changed. So so a great example we think about what if we could put grades on the blockchain? We could literally put every grade you get in the class and what you know you, you got a you know a 85 on that test, you know, we could put that on there. And we could put what are the skills each class got you. And you could then control access to that data depending on what somebody might need it for, right? So if, if you want to prove to somebody you have the skills to do a job, you know, you might want to share with them the skills you got in three courses at the University of Illinois. Uh, and you might want to show, you know, look, I, I got A's in these courses, or I got on, on that particular part of the course, you know, I, I had A-level work. Um, this is something that would be enabled by blockchain technology that would be much more difficult with traditional technologies that people historically use in these spaces because they're more siloed and they're they're not designed for the sorts of uh, decentralized open communication the blockchains are and, and and again this is just one technology that we wanted to explore we built this and it turns out hey guess what we're like the first business school um, one of the first if not the first business school to ever build their own blockchain and to have students be actively involved and you know that that in and of itself was sort of great for geese. Um, but then we started realizing that we should be teaching this, right? So I created a course uh, on blockchain. I've taught it a couple of times, and now we're creating a, a MOOC uh, for the online space as well. So this is this is how we, we learn and are able to help the students, but also help the faculty and staff and then, you know, alumni and co companies that want to partner with us understand what's coming and how to, how to try to get ahead, front run these opportunities. I do want to go back in time a little bit to you being, and you mentioned this briefly, an astrophysicist, and that was kind of your um, initial plan. How how did that happen, and um, what then, do you see ways that, that that training has led to your ability to do your job as a disruption officer now? So, so I grew up on a on a farm in Indiana. Um, my dad worked in Chicago. Um, I was up in Northwest Indiana. My dad worked in Chicago. I had a long commute, uh, but but because of that, I had a lot of time to think, and I had to, you know, you you literally have to do things. You have to make things work, and and so I've always had that interest in, you know, why do, why do things work? How how are they? How how do they work? Why why are things done a certain way? Um, and and you know, growing up in Indiana. Um, I went to Purdue State School um, initially to study engineering, but as I was there, I was kind of like, you know, what am I really interested in? And it, and it turned out I was really interested. Uh, well, I was interested in everything, which is part of the problem. Uh, but 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 what really interested me the most were two things. One was computer science, and one was physics. Um, now, in hindsight, maybe I should have stayed with computer science, uh, but I was really interested in physics, and in large part because it it helps you by by learning how to set up problems and approach problems from what knowledge do you have and how do you extrapolate from that knowledge into new areas uh, and I really enjoy that I really like that and and that's sort of been the basis of of my career um, that whole approach but I've also always retained that strong CS interest and you know, when I became a senior, um, rather than just taking a job or trying to get a, get a good employment somewhere, I, I decided I really wanted to, to continue my education. And, um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm always, I've been a lifelong learner uh, from the, from the get-go. Um, and I chose to do a PhD in astrophysics uh, in large part because astrophysics is a science where you don't have a lab. You, you don't go in the lab and I'm going to run these experiments or I'm going to go out in the field and collect this, you know, this data here. You know, you have to sit there and observe what the universe gives you, or you go into a computer and you simulate uh, what the universe might be doing based on certain assumptions of, of how it works. And thus, there's, there's this deep connection with computer science and that, that field, astrophysics. And so I really like that, and I like the fact of trying to answer big questions and understand stuff. So I did the PhD in astrophysics at Johns Hopkins at Baltimore, um, and and my my sort of graduate work focused on uh, designing and building the data archive for one of the first large scientific surveys, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and that was really interesting. I really enjoyed that. It was a big data project before big data was really a, a thing. 
Um, this is, you know, 25, 30 years ago now. Um, and, and so that was a lot of fun. We did a lot of interesting things, met a lot of interesting people, worked with a lot of great companies. And that led me to go to Caltech, um, where I worked um, for a number of years doing similar things. But there I sort of grew from, uh, you know, doing the data archiving and sort of data analysis more into uh, learning about machine learning and how machines can analyze large amounts of data and get new insights. So in some sense, this was early AI work. Um, and, and that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then University of Illinois uh, effectively created a new position that was joint between the astronomy, de astronomy department and the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, that really sort of was perfect for what I wanted to do, which was really get into lots of data, uh, data analytics, machine learning, and sort of see, you know, what could we do with this, these sort of new ways of, of approaching um, big questions. And that was really gathering lots of data and then applying really uh, new and interesting algorithms with people from all over to sort of answer these questions. And, you know, I, I did that for a number of years, but, you know, over time I started realizing that my passion was really uh, not just confined to astrophysics. Uh, I mean, you said you said I was an astrophysicist. I think I think I still am an astrophysicist. I just just do lots of other things, you know. Um, but the the passion was really about these technologies and what they enabled. And so I, I started working with people outside of of astrophysics and physics uh, in different engineering do domains um, in uh, other colleges, and really started realizing that what I had seen before in astronomy was now starting to impact many other areas and that it was not just helpful that I could help them uh, in their projects. It was interesting, right? I'm um, learning how to apply some of the same things we had done on astronomy data to data, uh, you know, in, in other countries to understand how deforestation was growing and were there ways to predict what would happen so that you could help mitigate uh, issues or encourage people to, to not cut down the trees. Um, how we could apply some of the uh, graph uh, algorithms that we were using to understand uh, ways to optimize food distribution in Africa. Um, th these were all projects that were really interesting. Um, and, and I learned that I'm really interested in a lot of these things. And that's where I, you know, if, if I was to, to, to jump ahead and, and, and just say, you know, we now, we always talk about our why, particularly here at Geese, we talk about our why. That was kind of my why is, is I want to help people, uh, you know, learn things and 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 become better at what they do or make their lives better, and and this is is how I could do it. So, that that whole effort is what eventually led me to connect with leaders here in the College of Business, you know, like Jeff, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and you know that was where they're like, well, would you be interested in coming over here and helping us, both in terms of how we're educating our students, but you know what we as a college should be doing, you know. At the time, primarily around data analytics, and then as I got over here and started getting involved, that's that's how that grew into this whole area of emerging technologies and disruption and what's coming and and how do we best prepare as a college uh, for ourselves? You know, how could we be doing things better, or are there things that we could be doing better or differently? But then, how do we prepare our students and our faculty, staff, and alumni for 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 the changes that are to come? Well, let's jump into some of those technologies, and and maybe we can do it this way. I'll, I'll say one of them and if you can give sort of a short uh elevator pitch definition of of what that is and then we can talk a little bit more about um how it's being used currently what we can expect maybe in the future and uh sort of learn a little bit as we go at least i, I know i'm gonna <laughs> so, learn a lot from well I, from this. first first question tim are we talking like an elevator in the willis tower or are we talking about an <laughs> elevator here you know maybe on campus is yeah two or three stars. maybe Maybe a Chicago elevator, because the ones on campus, you don't have very long. <laughs> well, Great I wasn't sure you were one of the, the, the long elevator ride or the short elevator ride. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to be succinct. Probably this is pretty a generic term and has a lot of potential definitions, but artificial intelligence in general is defined how? So I, I think this is a fascinating question to try and answer. Uh, but let me flip it on you, and, and I'm going to ask a rhetorical question, and you know, for you and, and anyone listening, and it would be, uh, if you want to know about AI or artificial intelligence, first you have to think about what is human intelligence, right? So think about the people you know or meet during the day. Do do they all have the same intelligence? 
right? From uh, your interactions. <laughs> absolutely what, not. Right, right. So, so from your interactions, you know, what does it even mean for them to be human? And I, and I asked that, you know, not to, to stall or to, you know, evade anything, but because it, it, when you think about it, you're trying to define artificial intelligence. It means we're really trying to compare it to something. And for us, that, that means human intelligence. Um, right. You, I could have said the same thing about a dog's intelligence or a dolphin's intelligence or, or some other animal. Um, and so when you think about how to answer that question, uh, I think it's always important to sort of frame it in terms of what's the context you're thinking about this, All right? And so that, of course, goes to human intelligence. And, and that leads us to perhaps the most frequent response to, to that particular question. And it's, it's currently known as the Turing test after Alan Turing, but Alan Turing originally called it the imitation game. And the idea basically came down to could an artificial entity like a computer fool a human into believing the artificial entity was a human? And if so, then you would consider that entity to be intelligent, okay? And so that, that kind of demonstrates why did I start thinking about a human? Because you'd be like, well, there's some people I talk to where you know it might be pre pretty easy to imitate them and other people it might be really hard. Um, and that could vary depending on how well you know them. Uh, it could vary depending on, you know, what their current mental state is. Are they tired or are they well rested? Um, it could depend on their education and, and your knowledge of their education area, because you might ask more complicated questions um, depending on your knowledge and their knowledge. So I think, I think that really is the core of trying to answer that. And at, at, at that level, you start thinking about it a more general approach would just simply be, can a computer do things, both how, how they complete, what they complete, and the way they complete it in a way that we feel is similar to what a human would do in that situation. And generally, when people approach this, whether it's that, that Turing test, the imitation game, or even this, this last question I just sort of posed, the answer is usually no. Right. You, you say the computer may do that calculation really fast, but it does it super fast, and it, but it doesn't do it in the way the human would. And it doesn't know what it's doing and, and all of that. Um, but with the growth of AI tools and techniques, uh, particularly generative AI tools like stable diffusion or chat GPT that have come on the scene in the last uh, six months to a year, the answer starts to become, I don't know, or even maybe. And I think that's what really captures and captivates people so much is that now we're starting to approach this this issue where that imitation game, you know, it's 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 much harder to think about, oh yeah, it's easy to tell the difference. It's it's not. And so I think really thinking about the problem in that context or the question in that context of you know, how do you explain what AI is? Well, simply put, it's just a computer doing things and you, you, you have a hard time knowing the computer did it. Um, but, but I think it's deeper when we really think about it. And honestly, part of that's probably Hollywood. There's been so many movies, you know, and generally the killer AI comes out and tries to wipe out humanity. And we, we think about that. Um, I mean, this is, this has gone on since 2001, A Space Odyssey, which came out in, I think, 1968. And the supercomputer Hal, who was, by the way, born in Urbana, Illinois, uh, you know, uh, tried to kill the crew. Um, and so, you know, we, we, a lot, you, you tend to have that in the back of your head. Um, and so there actually is a lot of concern nowadays from people and, and different, you know, experts sounding off on the alarms and the dangers. Um, you know, and I think it is important to ask the questions. Um, I'm much more optimistic than I think most uh, of those uh, folks are. But um, it is, it's, it's an incredible technology that has the potential to do amazing things that transform our lives in ways we are barely starting to understand. Well, our elevator ride made it to the sky deck, but the, the journey was wonderful and, warned, the, and the view is beautiful. Warned, it was worth it. The view was great. That's how you <laughs> say it. The view was great. Absolutely. I don't know what you said, but the view was great. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I think the other ones we'll probably talk about are are variations of artificial intelligence. They probably fall under that category. And you mentioned one of them a minute ago um, that I understand the very, very basics. Like I, I know what it's supposed to do, but, but chat GPT 
is has been everywhere. It seems like in the last number of months. Um, what what is that, and and do you see it as something that's just a hey, this is pretty cool, but it's not going to stick around, or this is really the beginning of something? Well, I hope I hope we're not confined to an elevator here. So ChatGPT is something that uh, the tool itself may not be around, but it's because it's been replaced by something similar and better. Um, ChatGPT, you could really think of it as two things. First is this chat-like interface part that is an amazing way to interact with some sort of intelligence, right? Uh, and if you think about it, ChatGPT, going back to my conversation about the imitation game, this is one way you could think of having an imitation game where you wouldn't know, is there a computer on the other side or is there a human on the other side or humans who can answer questions quickly with, with typing or whatever. Um, and I think that's what really has differentiated AI in the minds of most people from other areas, okay? so. That's the first part. The second part is this generative AI tool. It's, it's based on a large language model where they've taken all of the data they can scrape on the internet, they pull it together, and this has been trained, some huge model, you know, 100 billion parameter model trained on this data. Um, but it's a very simple idea that it basically tries to predict what should the next word be. So given that I've, I've already said these words, what should the next word be? It's not what's the best way to answer that question. It's what's the best way that these words should get strung together, right? That, that's at its premise how this text-based generative AI model works. So when you're using an interface like ChatGPT, you ask it a question or you say something uh, into the, to the dialogue box, and it uses that to start inferring its answer. And as it keeps going, it continues to do so. And at the end, you say thumbs up or thumbs down. Did I like it or did I not? And it then uses that response to become better over time. So the more people use it, the better it is at giving data back to you that you and or others think is useful. So in a sense, it's basically a propagating self-training imitation game that is just going to keep getting better at answering the questions quicker and in ways that that you like. And and so that's at its core why this has become such a powerful tool that has just burst onto the public's consciousness because there really wasn't anything quite like this before. In a different way this reminds me a little bit of I don't remember how long ago it was now when we first began hearing about Pandora and their project of learning people's music tastes and being able to suggest new songs based on what other songs they'd like, and it just learns and keeps getting better and better. It it feels like a, just a much more complex version of that. That's actually a really good analogy. Um, actually, no, it's a really good example of how AI has already been involved in our lives. Uh, and and right so so whether you use Pandora or Apple Music or Spotify or you're streaming on Netflix, these services use what you do and how you interact with the platform to learn how to do their job better. And in large part, the reason they do that it's economic. They're driven by economics to increase your engagement with their platform, because the longer you're on their platform, the more money they'll make via advertisements. So. This is something which absolutely, the, these sorts of, of AI approaches are really taking a large amount of data, the interaction of the tool with the user, and learning how to best meet the needs of the user and increase engagement. Um, it's just that this new stuff like ChatGPT is a little more general. The, the last one I want to talk about is, and I think I'm using this word correctly, is it deep fakes? Is that the correct sure. terminology? And this yes, feels, yes, yes. while all of it can be a little weird and a little creepy maybe or, or scary to some, this one feels, at least on the surface, dangerous. But define what it is first and then give me your thoughts. I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to process how to answer your question in light of some of the comments you said, particularly there at the end. Um, the, dangerous, the dangerous aspect, there, there is dangers here. So when we hear about deep fakes, what are we talking about? Deep is simply referring to the type of machine learning model that's used. Um, it's deep learning or deep neural networks. 
uh, and they've been around for roughly a decade, maybe a little more. Um, they they basically are at the heart of all of the most powerful AI models and tools that are out there. Um, and so deep, the fake part simply means they're you're faking some data. Um, and there's been a lot of work in these AI algorithms, um, not so much to generate fake data for fake data's purpose, but because one way to make models better is to say, well, here's reality. Let me generate a fake version of reality and compare them. And the better I get at making fake realities, the better I must understand true reality. All right. So that's a simple sort of understanding of how this, this process works. Um, well, it turns out that as, as you start be generating better and better, you know, fake realities, which could be people's faces or people's voices, you can get much better at finding people's faces in an image or which, which obviously of interest for, you know, people using cameras or for generating, um, you know, voices, uh, synthetic voices. So that's a very powerful technology. Initially, it was used for some malicious activities, you know, putting, uh, you know, famous people's faces in compromising situations. Uh, there's now talk of politicians using deep fakes to, uh, you know, make it look like their adversary is saying or doing something they shouldn't. Um, and so it is, has, it does have a huge potential for dangerous uh, outcomes or misuse. Um, but I think the biggest thing here is the educational aspect. It's dangerous when people don't know it's a possibility, or it's dangerous when people are caught unaware that something could be done like this. So I think our first step is to educate people. This is a possibility that you need to be aware that you don't just believe everything that, that, is, that is out there on the internet or that comes into your email inbox or your Facebook feed or, or whatever, but that you're aware of these things that you need to confirm uh, where things are coming from. I think the second thing is we need to develop better ways to ensure the integrity and transparency of uh, and, and accuracy of some of these media. And, and that probably would involve a blockchain uh, as a good way of, of solving that problem. But then I also would say this technology also has amazing potential to make things better in many ways. And, and I'll give you a simple example. I, I talked earlier about this course I'm creating uh, it's on emerging technology and disruption, and it's all about teaching people how to, you know, in some sense, do my job or, or, or sort of learn how I do my job and, and sort of be able to do that themselves in their lives and their, and their work. And one of the conditions for me doing this, creating this for our online degrees was saying, okay, well, we got to start using some emerging technologies to make our lives better and to see how uh, higher education may be changing in the future, right? It's back to this uh, bias to action idea. And so we are using AI everywhere we can. And some of that is, um, hey, look, there's a lot of content I've taught uh, this stuff before. Help me synthesize this down from two lectures to one or three lectures to two. Uh, and AI can help with that. Uh, some of it is helping me to create transcripts for a video that I'm gonna go in the studio and record uh, or create a draft on this and take all of these uh, uh, different viewpoints and synthesize it. And then I'm gonna go in and and sort of uh, put it in my voice and make sure everything's right and that it still flows with everything else. Uh, so, so those are, are some specific examples, but it goes beyond that. Can we use AI to improve the video creation and editing process? There's, there's tools, Photoshop has come out with some tools recently to do that. But going even farther than that, uh, if, if I'm in the studio and I'm recording and suddenly an elevator dings or somebody walks by the studio door and makes noise, you know, do we have to reshoot? Well, not with the deep fake. They can take the, the synthesized version of my voice, which we've made, and have me say that line again with no interruptions. Uh, and we've even gone further than that and used AI to generate video of me so that we can have a script and then have the video generated of me saying those words. And that sort of starts to open people's eyes of, well, why should we be interested in this course on emerging technology and disruption? Well, here you go, right? This whole idea of deep faking and thinking about this is here, this sort of technology is only going to get better. How do we get ahead of this so that we're able to push it into directions that's going to lead to greater benefit for society and, 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 and businesses than perhaps otherwise would happen? Last big question. Uh, and 
it just involves sort of looking forward. I know it's hard to predict these things when they are already groundbreaking and sort of on the edge of just now emerging. But what excites you most um, about whether it's AI or other technologies that you see on the horizon, both in general for society and then specifically for Geese College of Business? Oh, Tim, I don't know if I can answer that question. Just one. There are so many amazing things out there. Um, we've spent a Hit lot of highlights. It's yeah, fun. We, we've spent a lot of time talking about AI and I've mentioned blockchain and I talked a little bit about augmented reality and, and you know, Apple's now introducing um, their new device to make augmented reality and development of applications using it um, easier. And so I think we're going to see a lot of growth there. I think we'll see a lot of growth in the next few years on, on new ways of using blockchain that disrupt industries from insurance to real estate to, to personal identification and, and all kinds of assets being tracked. Um, it, those, those are amazing. But I think there's other things that are, you know, when we think about the horizon and we think about a year, several years or more, it, it's there's so many that are out there um, that it's just amazing. And, you know, I think a lot of them could could have major impacts. I mean, there's things that are probably not on those people's radars, like personalized medicine or continued growth of, of EVs, but but having widespread and full autonomy. Um, and what does that do for cities when, you know, cars are self-driving and, and people don't need to park their cars? Um, you start thinking about these things, it's amazing. Um, I guess if there's one thing that I'm personally think is really interesting and, and, and sort of just in awe of is the idea of quantum computers. Um, computers are so prevalent in our in our lives, and you think about the potential for a new type of computer that would be exponentially more powerful than current computers. I just think that would cause so many new disruptions as it impacts all of these other technologies that that we sort of have have talked about. Um, that it just is amazing to think about what could come, and 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 how that would basically impact every field and every industry and every aspect of our lives to, you know, have computers that suddenly are, you know, a million or a billion times faster than they currently are. Um, and that obviously would play into AI because AI is running on computers. So you think about that. And I think that, that that's probably the, what's, what's so exciting is it's these, these technologies, not just them in isolation, it's they come together and they, they sort of impact things together and what happens. It's just, it's just so exciting and it's so amazing to think about what's coming and how the world's going to change. And we haven't even talked about sports, obviously sports, something relevant to you and how obviously a lot of people know about AI. I mean, about data analytics impacting sports. When you think about um, fantasy football as an example, right? Data analytics played a lot of role there, but, but what is VR doing there and how you can quarterbacks can train now year round without having to be around all the other teams and things. So I, it's just, to me, is amazing. And the confluence of things like esports and gaming with reality and sort of game theory incentivizations for people. And it, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, there's so many interesting, amazing things going on. I, I've heard there are a number of Major League Baseball teams who have computer pitchers that learn all of the other pitchers and what they throw and how they throw it and how fast they throw and then those machines can throw batting practice to players so they can practice hitting off of Clayton Kershaw or you know pick your pitcher yeah no I, I agree I, I and and you know those are the things you know about right, right. Uh, the secret sauce is, is, is not always shared so uh, it's it is amazing I think we could have talked for hours about all of the different technologies on the horizon but that's all for today's episode. Please be sure to join us for the next Geese download. And in the meantime, you can learn more about the Geese College of Business at geese.illinois.edu.